Pascal offered a bargain. He would return home if Henry agreed to license the English Bible now, not at some unspecified future date. An offer that made sense to Cromwell, but not to his king. No, said Henry, no Bible in English. And one of the ironies of the early 1530s is that Tyndall's works were still illegal. In fact, they'd been banned by the church with Henry's backing. So uh, you've got the odd situation that there are people in Henry's close entourage who are hugely sympathetic to Tyndall. And yet this man is persona non grata, someone one can't speak about. I think one person who would have spoken to Henry about Tyndall would have been his queen, his prospective queen, that is, Anne Boleyn. Anne's was not the only voice. There was Thomas Cromwell, and even the Archbishop of Canterbury. And all three favoured the Protestant cause. Moore was increasingly isolated. Moore no longer had the ear of the king. Henry attacked the clergy who had opposed the divorce. In January 1531, he asserted his power over the Pope himself. He claimed independent authority over the church in England. But in terms of the church, nothing has changed. The church was still going on with its splendid round of Latin masses, the clergy was still celibate, and this was all part of Henry's church. The weirdness of the situation was that this was a Catholic church without the Pope. The instability of that situation meant that anything could happen. True Reformation seemed very close. Moore and many other faithful Catholics feared the worst. Strange events throughout the country were reported. Were their souls in peril? Was the end at hand? Two giant fish were dragged out of the Thames, which was considered to be a portent of future evil. There were 14 suicides in 14 days. Two priests were arrested and imprisoned for wounding one another in the Church of All Hallows. The Blessed Sacrament was stolen from the tabernacles of St. Michael's Cornell, St. Olaf's Heart Street, and the church of St. Dunstan in the West. Maybe the heralds of the great Antichrist, which as God helps me, I fear is very near his time. I fear this year of dark schism and endless change. I fear the coming of the great beast. I pray the king may not turn to darkness. Moore feared the apocalypse, but his king had had enough of Rome and its refusals. A whole set of canon lawyers was recruited to show the king how he was actually supreme head of the church, that the Bishop of Rome had no jurisdiction in his realm, on May the 15th, 1532, the clergy of England formally submitted to the king. From this time forward, church law would be determined by Henry alone. Bishops, for example, would no longer have the power of arresting anyone suspected of heresy. For the first time in his life, Moore now spoke out publicly against his master. But it was too late. He had already lost the argument. Moore's position as Lord Chancellor was untenable. He resigned. The King released him from his service, but would never forget or forgive Moore's failure. The sea is closing above my head. Chancellor Moore is no more. The King has graciously granted me leave to bestow the rest of my life in the service of God. Now, if I might die in a good cause, it would so comfort me that for the joy thereof, I would merrily run to death. The shackles have been struck from me. I have been made free of pride and worldliness. I exult in being nothing. I wish to be nothing. Moore returned to his self-appointed task, hunting heretics for the sake of England's soul. He had already written the dialogue on heresies, a direct attack on William Tyndale and all he stood for. You deny the holy rituals of the church, the holy fruit of 1,500 years. Tyndale had written a reply. 
The water hallowed by a priest is of no more effect than the water of a river or a well, since God blessed all things that he made. Now Moore set to work upon the confutation. He wrote more words than were contained in the Bible itself. He wished to destroy Tyndale. He wanted to destroy his beliefs. It was a struggle to the death. So you say that any desire to do good, to fast or give alms with the intent to reach heaven, is a deadly sin before God? Where faith is mighty and strong, there is love fervent and deeds plenteous. Anyone who knows the scriptures may save his own soul. If a man do sincerely strive to serve God, he cannot sin. Oh, this is your poison, Master Tyndale, whereby you take away all diligence and good endeavor to virtue, all care of heaven, all fear of hell, all desire of devotion, all rebuke of sin, all the laws of the world, all reason among men. Judge whether it be possible that any good should come out of their dumb ceremonies and sacraments, their penance, purgatories, pilgrimages, praying to posts, their dumb absolutions, dumb blessings, dumb putterings and howlings. Oh, do you hear his sighs from hell? By autumn 1532, Henry knew that all the building blocks were in place. He would get his new marriage. I think it's at this stage that Anne allowed Henry properly into her bed. Sometime in October 1532. That's when the conception of the child happened. This was the crucial moment. With Anne pregnant, there was no time for delay. Henry married her secretly, and Parliament was ordered to pass laws that would underwrite Henry's status as head of the church, as well as the legitimacy of the child upon its birth. The child arrived in September of 1533. A daughter, really not what was wanted. This child was called Elizabeth. This was a good thing. It was a good sign because at least it showed Anne was fertile. There wasn't going to be a problem in getting a second child. And of course, the next job would be to get a son. Two months after Elizabeth's birth, Tyndale, still in hiding in Antwerp, had completed a revision of the New Testament. Once again, copies were smuggled into England. But in England, heresy had come to matter less than loyalty, and the time had come for test cases. On April the 12th, 1534, Moore was asked to swear to a new oath, the Oath of Succession, an apparently innocuous oath of loyalty to the king and his offspring by Anne Boleyn. It was a test that Moore's Catholic conscience would not allow him to pass. <laughs> 